chapter number 18. Now this morning we're going to read a lot of verses. And I'm not going to have time to go through all of it. Not in one service. But the purpose of reading all of it is to see this one common thread throughout this chapter that Christ is trying to teach. So we're going to begin our reading in verse number 1, Matthew 18. The Bible says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso, ever, and whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them into the into cast them from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life whole or main rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, it is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. How think ye if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so, be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone, and he shall hear thee. And if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he neglect to hear them, tell it to the, unto the church, but if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? And Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had began, begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him ten thousand talents. But 
But for as much as he had not to pay, the Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and his, all that he had in the payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their ruler all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desirest me. Should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, and even as I had been and his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Let's pray. Dear heavenly Father, I pray as we come to this your message this morning, dear God, that you give me clarity of thought and mind as I preach. Dear God, I pray that you would set me aside. You know the human flesh is weak. Dear God, I know you are strong. I pray that you would give me the very things that I need this morning to be able to preach the strength and the power of you for a long time. And I pray that I would get the things across in a clear and precise manner. I pray that each and every person is here. Their heart will be open, ready to receive what you would have for them individually this morning. And dear God, that uh, your name would be glorified through it all. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And amen. In Matthew 18, 1 through 10, we find that the danger here of offending the brother. The question is asked, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Is it you and I? Though our Lord speaks of offending little ones. The interpretation, of course, here is talking about little children. But God also calls us His little children in 1 John 2 and 1. He says, my little children, referring to us. And we need to be careful about offending little children. Offending young people in the faith. In verses 11 through 14, we find the value of one. In the sight of the Lord, as He looks down and He sees the ninety and nine, but he sees that one's missing. The shepherd goes out in search of that one. And again, in verse 14, we find him also uh, referring to these wandering sheep as little ones. Lost here, he's talking about they're out of the fold. Now listen, we know people get out of the fold and, and we should go try to get them. Sometimes they don't want to come back because of offenses. And that's the reason we see that God is talking about be careful of offending in this chapter. In verses 15 through 20 we see the mention of church discipline. It's ironic that we look at this chapter and God says, be careful of offending little ones. But if one gets offended and leave, go out and, and try to bring him back. But then you see church discipline with it. If a brother has a fault, we're to go to him uh, individually and try to get it settled. And if he gets settled, then you gain a brother. But if he doesn't want to get it settled between you and him individually, then you take some witnesses and so forth. 
And if they don't want to, at the end, hear the church, then you're to treat them as a heathen and public. But all of these have the same tie together. Then we see in verses 21 through 35, Peter starts out by asking, Lord, if my brother offend me, how many times shall I forgive him? Seven? Peter here thought he was being generous. God says, no, 70 times seven. The infinite in forgiveness. But our Lord has a greater lesson in store here for the disciples and for us. His response goes quick or quite far beyond just the simple ask of or asking of our for, or of forgiveness. But you see this common thread throughout these verses, this passage. And it's that if you have been hurt by someone, trying to get things right. And what, I, what I want us to look at and think about this morning is the value of forgiveness. The value of forgiveness. A good analogy of this parable is a man catches an individual embezzling from a company and the amount runs into the tens of thousands of dollars. He spends the money and the thief have no means to which we're, we're paid. Instead of bringing the culprit to the court, the boss, though he has been greatly hurt, forgives and continues to allow the person to work for him. The boss comes in the next day and finds the forgiven worker mad at his co-worker because he owes him for a five dollar meal that he has not been paid. You see the things are comparable. As we look at this passage at this last section and think about the forgiveness and God's infinite forgiveness. God says forgiving 490 times he, he puts out that number I believe using the numbers of completions to do it. But I want you to think about it. Think about this debt that was forgiven for a little bit. 10,000 talents. Now a talent in Christ's day was approximately 130 pounds. 120 to 130 pounds thereabouts. But gold, precious metal, something I've recently learned is measured in what they call troy ounces. It's not the regular 16 ounces per pound. It's 12 ounces per pound. Now, 10,000 talents at 130 pounds and 12 troy ounces to pounds and the approximate value of gold of $1,571.90 puts the debt in today's value at $24,521,000,000. In other words, it's a debt you can't... I don't even see how he acquired such a debt, but that doesn't matter. It's a debt he could never, ever possibly repay. Most of us will never have a hundred million go through our hands in a lifetime, let alone 24 billion. And so I want us to think about how, be how great and beautiful type of this forgiveness it was that the master did for the servant. I mean, it was complete. It was immediate. He didn't say you were going to have to give me something back for a while and then I'll forgive the rest of it. He did it completely immediately. Oh, what an 
mess them out together. But I want us to think about something. God does not forgive us because His law means so little to us. He forgives even though our disobedience and sinfulness deeply hurts Him and is against Him and offends Him. And even that we trample under the blood of Christ in our sins despite the Spirit of grace that He's given us. Despite all of that, He's forgiven us anyway. He's not forgiven us because He thinks that the sin that we did, the laws that we broke against Him was unknowing. Most of the sins that we commit, we know exactly what we're doing. Little kids learn from a young age what lying is. Yet we grow up lying. You know what you're doing when you're taking something and you don't know what, and it's not yours. We sin willfully all the time. And God doesn't just forgive us because He thinks we're ignorant about what we're doing. He knows we know exactly what we're doing, yet He forgave us anyway. God has not forgiven us so much a debt that we can never repay. And yet we fail to forgive those who trespass against us. We have such a mighty debt of sin against us. Something we can never repay. I'll be honest with you, we flat wear out. First John 1 9. I mean, that thing is just so worn out. Because we always go back. The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us for sin and us on all unrighteousness. So think about forgiveness, but I also think about the model prayer of God that's given us in Matthew chapter 6 where it says, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Have you ever thought about that statement? You know what that statement's saying? God Forgive me as I forgive my debtors, but don't forgive me where I don't forgive my debtors. Do you ever think about that? We like to think of praying and asking God to forgive us of our debts. But what the model prayer is saying, literally, as I don't forgive my debtors, don't forgive me, Lord. Now, that's Christ's model prayer. You know that goes perfectly with what we're looking at in this passage. Now, when we look at verse 34 and 35, in our forgiveness, we find forgiveness. This is a strong statement and shows the importance and value of our forgiveness to others. We are so quick to ask God to forgive our sins while praying down the judgment of God on other people. Oh yes, when people offend us, I think, I wish God would just take care of them. I wish God would just take care of them. What are you doing? You're asking God to judge them and punish them. But on the other hand, we're over oh Lord, please forgive me. Lord, judge it. Take care of that situation. They need to get right with you. Oh, Lord, please forgive me. Lord, they, they offended me. Take care of them. That's what we got to do. But the Bible talks about our need to 
to forgive in our hearts those that offend us. No restoration can take place until he or she gets right with the Lord and with us. But our forgiveness, our forgiveness needs to be immediate, it needs to be complete, and it needs to be eternal in our hearts. In other words, we don't just keep bringing it back again and again. Our personal forgiveness has great temporal value. So this morning, I, I want us to look at the value of forgiveness. You see, when we forgive, our forgiveness shows God's forgiveness. When we forgive those that offend us, we are showing God's forgiveness for us. The forgiveness of God cannot be seen in this life. Though He has forgiven us so wonderfully and completely, we know our sins are forgiven and we have a home in heaven. But our forgiveness to other individuals can be seen in this life and should be seen in this life. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, the Bible says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Notice what happens when we forget, fail to forgive. Turn with me back to Hebrews chapter 12. The Bible says in verse 14, 15, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, thereby many be defiled. Or defiled. You see, when unforgiveness happens in your heart, bitterness will come. And you will become to have a, a bitter heart. And the bitter heart does more to hurt you or us than the one who offended you to begin with. It grows out of a hidden root but soon springs up and becomes visible to others. Bitterness. Once it goes from bitterness, it starts troubling you. In Hebrews 12, 15. When it's uncared for, the bitterness becomes your enemy in your spiritual life and spiritual walk. Now we are hurting ourselves as we walk around thinking about our hurt and having malice towards someone else. Their malice towards us has now turned into our malice towards them The result becomes wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and bitterness. You see, we need to forgive others and show God's forgiveness. Because the end of all of that, of unforgiveness, becomes the fire. 
to us. The Bible says, and therefore, or thereby may be defiled. They'll be defiled. You will be defiled. Our forgiveness has now offended many others who has done nothing to us. Unforgiveness in our heart. We need to be able to show forgiveness in order to show God's forgiveness towards us. And also, not just when we forgive, but when we restore our restoration shows God's restoration for us. In 1 Corinthians 5, a man was disciplined by the local church for fornication. He would not get it right with the Lord and was put out and turned out until such a time as he repented and made it right with the church. Evidently, this man got right with the Lord and tried to get right with the church but in the church, we find unforgiveness. Paul's dealing with. Listen to what it says in 2 Corinthians 2, 6 and 8 through 8. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was afflict, inflicted by many, so that counterwise ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with over much sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love towards him. Restoration. You think about what Christ was saying back in Matthew 18. He's saying when we forgive or when we sin, God forgives. But when we do not forgive ourselves, we cannot get right with God. When we think about what He's saying in Matthew, this individual that doesn't want to get it right with the other individual, then don't want to get it right between the three. And then does not want to get it right in front of the church. Listen, our job is to try to see them restored. When we think of this, realize some people cannot forgive themselves therefore don't want to be forgiven and don't want to get away in such cases you, there cannot be restoration our goal is to restore to bring them back into the form in the story God gives us the 90 and 9 and the one lost and the one return. That should be our goal. But if the one doesn't want to return, doesn't want to get things right with God, there's nothing you can do for them. Same thing with you and your walk with God. God's goal is to restore you to fellowship with Him. That's what God wants more than anything in the world, to have your fellowship, your walk, your Christian walk. But, if you don't want to get it right with God, God cannot restore you. You know, a lot of times, things happen. People, we do things sometimes that we cannot forgive ourselves. Now, I, I don't know, most of you probably don't know very many, if any, Vietnam vets. You know, I, that is a big problem with Vietnam vets. You know, I believe it's a big problem with all these people 
that are over in the Middle East right now fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. They cannot forgive themselves for the things that happened. Therefore, they cannot receive forgiveness from anyone else. That's the reason. And the Bible says here uh, in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 7, Thus perhaps such a one should be swallowed up, swallowed up in their own guilt with overmuch sorrow. He says, I beseech you that ye would confirm your love towards him. Help him to realize that you love you, we're forgiven you. Too many times, individuals do things in their lives that they, they cannot forgive themselves. Therefore, does not, even though you say, I forgive you, they don't want forgiveness because they cannot forgive themselves. In 1 John 3, 20, this is what they need to know. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. You know what's wrong? When people cannot accept forgiveness, it's because they have that deep guilt within themselves they cannot forgive themselves. The Bible says, for if our heart condemns, it's talking about you condemning yourself, we need to realize God is greater than See, when we sin and ask God for forgiveness, we are forgiven at that point. And as far as God is concerned, that sin has become white as snow. Because our godly sorrow for our sinfulness, we often beg God time and time again to forgive that sin. You know why we're always doing that? Because we've not forgiven God, when God forgives it, it's done. But we have to get to a place where we forgive ourselves and let it be in the past. When we forgive and restore, when we forgive and restore, we resist Satan, Amen. which causes him to flee. In 2 Corinthians, they were forgiven corporately. They were to forgive immediately. They were to forgive completely. This was for two reasons. Lest the sinful brother have much or over much sorrow in them. I already hit that some, so I don't want to hit that real hard. But in other words, the sorrow overtakes him and burns him. Or burden the down where they can't stand. Sometimes I think it's a lot of things where suicide comes in because they cannot forgive themselves. Listen, we have to get to the place where we this if God has forgiven it, you can forgive it. And put it behind you. You know we have a spiritual warfare going on in the church. 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 11. The Bible says, To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant. Paul was telling them, listen, if you forgave it, I forgave it. It's gone. That's the way it should be. When we don't do that, you 
you let Satan have a foothold in your life. You allow a foothold, it can become a stronghold. Paul said this is one of his devices that he uses to get in and control our lives. He gets the upper hand in this matter of forgiveness. He battles us on many fronts at the same time, though we fight him off in most of these areas, he continues to get a foothold in this area of forgiveness in our life. We need to take care of that. We need to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. And then finally, when we forgive in a biblical manner, it helps the repentant brother to be able to get victory over his sin. I want to use a verse that we are so familiar with here to make an application. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all, all unrighteousness. When we confess our sinfulness, God is ever faithful to forgive us, but there's a second part to this verse. He does two things. He forgives our sin, but He also cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Listen. When others sin against us and we forgive for the same reason, as they see forgiveness of God in us, as it is, is exercised towards them, it helps to cleanse them of all unrighteousness. It causes sin and hurt, or that causes sin and hurt in them. You see, that's just the opposite of what the world does. Yes. When someone gets in trouble and goes to jail, pays his debt, he comes out. Is the slate wiped clean? No. The world is just the opposite. Within the realm of the church, God needs to see something different in us, or the people need to see something different in us than what they see in the world. We need to be able to uh, forgive fully and completely. If a brother comes and, and makes it right with God, then he be right. He should be right. The Bible says, 1 John 1, verse 7, but if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin. Walking in the light entails complete and full forgiveness. It says, walking in the light has let me ask you, has He forgiven you completely? Has He forgiven you fully? Has He forgiven you at all? Then according to what the Bible teaches, we should do the same. In conclusion, one of the most valuable things that we can do within our church is to forgive immediately Everyone, including the lost, will gain it as they see the forgiveness of God manifested in you.
we want to see people's lives change, they need to see it. What is the value of forgiveness in the world? That's right. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for the word. Dear God, I pray as we come to this time of invitation that you take these few words and burn them in our hearts and lives. Dear God, help us to be able to look to you to do more for you. Have the forgiving hearts that you desire to have. That we can be right with the brothers so they can get right with you. We can have fellowship with one another. I pray, dear God, that you just bless them.